I frantically looked around for some desperate way out of this situation. The screams were so loud now that I expected the freaks to appear from around the corner. I noticed a small store with an open sign on the door, so I tried it with all my strength, hoping to God it was unlocked. To my surprise, the door easily gave way, making me stumble headfirst inside. Angela, come on. I called out to my surviving partner, who seemed to be preoccupied, frantically looking around, clutching her axe. Angela! I yelled again, and she snapped her head to me and practically jumped inside. I shut the door and ducked behind the counter, just in time to see a dozen freaks run past us on the street, all screaming along the way and muttering some gibberish just like Travis did. Angela and I silently stared at each other, breathing heavily and probably thinking the same thing. What the hell just happened? The gunshots started again, but were very distant this time. The screamers all seemed to be flocking to the sound of gunfire, which was good for us. A few more minutes passed as we listened to the cacophony of bullets and screaming with an occasional freak running past the store. Eventually, Angela and I started to regain our composure when all the outside noise died down. They shot Ricky, she said, looking down. They shot him. Listen, we need to keep moving. I approached her, glancing at the street every couple of seconds. We're not safe here, and evacuating obviously isn't happening. Do you know of any other safe places? She thought for a second, and her eyes closed, as if she had trouble recalling. Uh, the only place I know is my company. She finally responded. It's got pretty good security, but I don't know how safe it is there now. Other staff members could be infected there. It's our only option now. The pharmaceutical company isn't far from here, right? Yeah, we should be there in no time. I have an access card. She finally seemed to snap out of her trance and focus. Alright. Here's what we do. We go to your company. We wait it out a few days. If it has good security, maybe your coworker Daniel and some other people could be working on a cure right? I don't know, it's a long shot. They could all be dead or gone by now, and the building overrun. Look, your coworker is the only one who told you this was a parasite, and that we can slow it down with antibiotics. He might, just might, know something more. And since the government doesn't plan to let us out, we might as well see if we can get treated first, and then look for another way out. Okay, okay. She nodded. Let's go check it out. If there's even the slightest chance of survivors being there, we need to get there. And if it's deserted, we can still stay there for a bit, until we figure out our next move. And if the freaks are there, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Right? Let's go. I clutched Travis's baseball bat and peeked outside through the glass door. It looked safe enough, so we slowly exited the store and started making our way to the destination. The pharmaceutical company is at an intersection, so we gotta be real careful, Angela said. Sure enough, as soon as we exited the alleys and reached the main street, we saw a bunch of freaks scattered on the road, aimlessly walking around abandoned cars and dead bodies. Their footsteps looked unnatural, almost as if they forgot how to walk, and were now learning it from scratch. From time to time they would scream, shout some gibberish, or even violently cough and retch. We can use the garage to get to the entrance. Angela said and pointed to a security barrier, which opened to an underground garage. 
Carefully, we descended down, making sure we made as little noise as possible. The outside noises faded once we reached the bottom, which greatly improved our morale. A lot of cars over here seemed untouched. Only a couple of vehicles were crashed and left like that. So whoever had parked here never had the chance to escape. We stuck to the walls and it's a good thing too. Because as soon as we heard another discontinued scream, we froze in our tracks, trying to identify where it was coming from. But it was difficult due to the echo and the size of the garage. Another scream echoed. Have they found us? We waited for what seemed like ages, but nothing happened. I decided to take a peek and realized there was one man in a business suit, standing in the middle of the garage. He was facing away from us, just standing and his head twitching every now and then in an uncontrolled motion. The door is right there. Angela whispered, pointing to the left of the freak. I thought about sneaking past him, and there was a good chance we could have made it. But it was a gamble. Give me your axe, I told her, and she hesitantly gave it to me asking what I was doing. I looked around again to see if anyone was in the garage, but it seemed clear. Stay here until I take care of him, and if he sees me, don't try to help me. We're just both gonna get killed. I inhaled deeply and started taking very slow steps towards the freak. I held my breath, afraid that even the slightest noise would alert him. The freak shrieked and then went silent. He hadn't seen me yet. Step by step, I got closer. And as I did, I was able to hear him more clearly. The freak was muttering something between moans and head jerks. No, no, can't do it. But break free. He said among other things. I was only a few feet away from him now. He screamed loud, which made me stop dead in my tracks. My heart was pounding a million miles per hour. This is it, I thought. He's gonna turn around in a matter of seconds. His friends will join in and rip me apart. But he just went silent again and continued doing what he was doing before. I gripped the axe as tightly as I could exhaling slightly and bracing myself. Before I could give myself the chance to chicken out, I raised the axe above my head and brought it down with full force. The freak jerked his head in my direction one last time, just in time to see me, but it was too late. The axe connected with his collarbone, bringing him down to his knees with blood spurting everywhere. He tried to open his mouth to utter something, but only a soft gasp came out before he fell sideways, his eyes still open as the pool of blood started to form around him. Oh damn, I gasped at the sudden realization of what I had just done. I suddenly felt sick and had I eaten prior to that, I would have emptied the contents of my stomach. I had just killed a human being. I stared at the dead body for what seemed like ages, thinking about whether this man had a family and what his name was, until I felt a tap on my shoulder. Hey, we gotta go. Angela reminded me and I nodded, unable to say a word. She snatched her axe from the dead body and said, you had to do it. If you hadn't killed him, you bet your ass he would have done it to you. She approached the door and swiped her card on the reader, which made a loud beeping sound. The sturdy door unlocked. I took one final look at the man in the suit and his empty gaze before Angela reminded me that we had to go. Thank God, she sighed as the door closed behind us. A male voice suddenly responded on the loudspeaker. 
Angela, is that you? Daniel? She responded, looking around for the source. A moment of silence and the voice crackled back to life. Come on up to the second floor. I have something important to show you. Well, come on. It's safe. The voice repeated. I'm in the security room. Angela and I looked at each other in bewilderment. She led us upstairs to the second floor through the once pristine hallways that were now decorated with knocked over garbage bins, broken vending machines, and from what I could see, some staff members. We rounded the corner and reached the door with the security sign. Angela was about to open the door, but I stopped her. Recalling how they surrounded my house and tried to trick me into letting them in. For all we knew, Daniel was already dead. Or worse. But before we could consider our next move, the door swung open and in front of us appeared a man in a lab coat, staring us down. Took you long enough, he said in a matter-of-factly tone and went back inside the room. We followed. Inside were dozens of monitors which were tracking movement via surveillance cameras throughout the building. I noticed movement on some of the feeds from those freaks, walking aimlessly about through certain sections of the building and outside, just like the ones we saw on the street earlier. Daniel sat in the security guard's chair and faced us. I only then noticed the gun next to him on the desk. Dan, I thought you were dead, Angela said. My thoughts exactly. I heard the armies killing our own. So when I told you to go there, he shook his head. I tried contacting you again to prevent you from going there but I couldn't reach you. I'm sorry. I should have known. Angela shrugged after a moment of silence. Dan, you said that this was some sort of parasite. Is there a cure for it? She asked. There's no cure. He responded with hesitation, and my heart dropped. You can slow it down with antibiotics. But even then, it's just a matter of time before the parasite develops resistance. We tried finding a cure, but we failed. What is this parasite? I asked. Dan sighed and nodded. Ever heard of Toxoplasma Gandhi? He asked. I didn't respond. Toxoplasma Gandhi, Dan repeated. A parasite which can only thrive in the intestines of cats. It infects a rat and takes over its mind. It then allows the rat to become easy prey and be eaten by the cat, which ingests the parasite and voila, it lives a happy life. Now, the parasite itself doesn't harm humans. It causes some minor behavioral changes, yes but people can live with it without even knowing they have it. This wasn't all just an accident, was it? Angela and I listened carefully, holding our breaths. No. Dan sighed, looking embarrassed. No, it wasn't. He continued after a short pause. The government was highly intrigued by the psychological changes T. Gandhi caused in humans. So they thought, what if we could control the parasite and use it to our advantage? So they established a fake pharmaceutical company in this town, and moved us to conduct the project here. They hired some citizens like Angela, to retain the image of a normal company. But behind the scenes we were experimenting with T. Gandhi. But why? I asked. Why use it? Lots of reasons, but the main one was creating an obedient and compliant nation. That was the initial goal, at least. After the initial success of manipulating T. Gandhi, 
and making sure the behavioral changes it caused in humans would be the ones they desired. The guys in command gave orders to start infecting citizens. What? Angela was appalled. He took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes. We administered the parasite via throat swabs and tongue dispensers. You probably remember the precautions the town had in order to prevent a possible Ebola outbreak five months ago. All citizens had to complete a mandatory throat culture and were therefore infected without even knowing it. The ones who moved out of the city in the meantime were tracked carefully. They've probably been neutralized or arrested by now. I thought about all this for a second. I never took the throat culture, I replied. How? Dan asked. I hadn't moved here by then. Well then, unless you ingest some feces, which contain this specific parasite, you're safe. I felt the surge of new hope. I felt as if I could run for miles. Dan continued. Anyway, everything was fine at first. The town's crime rates started dropping, more stabilities in the city, and so on. In fact, it was going so well that the top guys planned on running another experiment in which they could engineer the parasite into causing different behavioral changes and use it as a weapon of mass destruction. But then things got out of hand? Angela asked. Yes. People started complaining about feeling sick. And then there were reports of violent attacks and... Well... You know the rest. I've observed some of the infected, and apparently what happens is exactly like with the rats. The parasite takes control over the host. I don't know if the host is still aware, but my guess is he is. Probably like some other parasites, the host just can't control his actions. So why would the parasite cause this kind of violent behavior? I asked. My guess is they want full control. They probably control most of the neurons in the host, but not all of them. My mind went back to all the things I had heard. The freaks kept saying since this all began, find the host, no control, out. See this? Dan pointed to the camera feed on which we saw a freak at the front entrance twitching and holding his head, as if he was in pain. Whatever human is left in that body is fighting for control, but the parasite is too strong. He turned back to us. After the outbreak, the government announced evac at a few checkpoints in the city, but they changed their plans when they realized the severity of the situation. Our research team was to be extracted in case of an outbreak, but they never showed up, leaving us here to die. All those years working for them, and this is how they repay us. He stood up and paced around. He raised his index finger and continued. But the government doesn't know one thing. They moved their research here. The team was aware of a potential outbreak and the head of research built a secret exit unbeknownst to his superiors. That's how most of the staff escaped from here. They're outside the city already, no doubt. Wait, and they got out? Angela interrupted. Daniel reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a key. This key was given only to the research team. He gave it to Angela. Inside the storage on the second floor basement is a fenced off area, which you can open with this key. From there, it's a straight shot from the sewers to freedom. The superiors were always told it was a waste dump, so they never suspected anything. Wait, what about you? She asked. He smiled vaguely and sat back down. There's no escape from what I've done. This is my purgatory. You better go. It's only a matter of time before the government purges the city. 
Just then, a loud crash was heard downstairs. All three of us glanced at the camera feed, only to see the freaks crashing through the glass doors at the entrance. Looks like we're out of time, Dan said and shoved his gun to Angela. Dan! Angela started, but he raised his hand and silenced her. Go, he said impatiently. I'll distract them for you. Without hesitation, Angela and I sprinted down the corridor, which already had screams reverberating through it, and called the elevator. We waited, hoping it would arrive before the freaks did. And when it finally did, we jumped in and hit the B2 button. The last thing we heard before the doors closed was Dan's voice shouting, Over here, you infected freaks! and the screams becoming even more violent, if that was even possible. The sound of their footsteps and screams echoed through the pipes all around the elevator as we descended, and we prayed it wouldn't stop before reaching the basement. The screams grew weaker, and a few seconds later the doors opened, and we stood in a dark hallway. Another very loud shriek echoed as one freak came right at us, but before he could reach us, Angela put a bullet in his forehead, silencing him permanently. We sprinted through the dark basement until we reached a sturdy looking door. She used the key to open it and ushered me into the dark, cluttered room which was the storage. On the other side of the room was a gated fence which led to a dark passage. Angela unlocked it and motioned for me to go first. I rushed inside and as I did, I heard the sound of a door closing and a key turning in the hole. I turned around and saw Angela standing behind the gate, a look of defeat on her face. Angela, what are you doing? I asked. She shook her head. This is the end of the line for me. Angela, wait. Maybe you're okay. We can... I can already feel myself changing, she cried. You have to go without me. I was at a loss for words. I knew she was right. But my brain was looking for an alternative solution. Angela wiped her tears and reached into her pocket, pulling out a picture. She glanced at it and let out a loud sob. She then handed it to me, and upon inspecting, I saw it was a picture of a little girl in a school uniform, smiling widely. That's my daughter, Helena, she said. Her address is on the back. Please. Find her and give it to her. Angela, come on, you can give it to her yourself once we're out. The screams in the distance were starting to grow louder again. She shook her head and sniffled, wiping away her newly formed tears. Promise me. She grabbed my hand through the fence firmly. Promise me you'll find her. I nodded and uttered the words with a trembling voice. I promise. Good. I'm gonna give these bastards a memorable farewell. She dropped her backpack on the ground and readied her gun. The screams, which we had heard on the upper floors prior to this, were now permeating the basement in full force. Angela. I called out to her, and she looked back at me. Thank you, I said. She nodded and disappeared out of the room. The next few seconds were a mixture of screams and gunshots, until all that remained were just the screams. I closed my eyes and wiped the tears. I barely had the motivation to move, but I knew I had to go. I had to get out and find Helena. The next few hours were a blur, trudging through smelly water in the sewers with barely a sense of direction, until I finally saw rays of sunlight coming through bars of another fenced gate. 
It was unlocked luckily, and I stepped outside into a canal. I heard the whirling of a helicopter and looked above in time to see it flying under the morning sun, in the direction of the city. I glanced back. Seeing the city which was now blocked off by huge walls and military vehicles around it. They were far away from me though, so I was safe. I pulled out Angela's picture, to make sure it was still in my pocket, and looked at the back of it. Below the address was Angela's personal message, scrawled in a hurry. It read, Mommy will always be proud of you even if it means I can't always be there for you. I love you more than anything, baby. Mom. P.S. Listen to your dad while I'm not around. I suppressed the tears which I felt welling up in my eyes and put the picture back in my pocket. I changed my identity after that. News of the outbreak spread quickly and the media showed the death toll with the names of all of the people who had died, including my own. The CBDC explained the incident to the media as an unfortunate outbreak of an unknown virus. They further mentioned that the city had to be completely sterilized and the situation was now under control. According to the news, there were no survivors. Hey guys, thanks again for making it to the end of the video. Be sure to check out the author's book which I'll link below in the description. If you enjoyed the story, be sure to leave a like and a comment, and let me know what you thought of it.